This is uh, the scene for the latest in the series of New Age Business Briefings brought to you by the SABC and uh, sponsored by JSC Mining today. We're talking to the uh, provincial leadership uh, led by the Premier, uh, Notolo Kivit, uh, in, uh, on the stage here. We've got a studio audience here as well that are uh, joining us in the conversation. Um, Premier, you wanted to add something to the skills uh, emigration that we're seeing and also trying to find ways to entice Eastern Capers back to the province. Um, Peter, we, we don't need to be apologetic um, about being a, a skills and leadership basket of the country. Um, we, we know that major institutions have their head offices elsewhere. And, and therefore, the, the kind of caliber of people um, highly skilled enough that we grow in the province, we develop in the province. It is inevitable that they will leave because if ESCOM needs a, a, a CEO, it's not going to allow that CEO to stay in the Eastern Cape when the head, of, head office of ESCOM is in Gauteng. That person is going to inevitably leave the Eastern Cape for Gauteng. We know that major institutions have their offices, their head offices um, in, in, in such uh, big cities as Cape, as Cape Town and um, Johannesburg, uh, etc. And therefore, the issue of skills flight for me, um, looking at it, is not a, is, it's not a disaster. It's, it's an issue that proves a point that the Eastern Cape is the, the basket, leadership basket of the country. You come and pick from here mm -hmm. if you want the best leadership. But don't you want that skill? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's a good thing and uh, the other provinces will benefit. But the reality is you're the second largest province by la land area, third most populated. So in actual fact, this province should be one of the go-to provinces, not supplying. You should be attracting. How, that's, I guess, what the question is. How do we get this province sexy enough for people to want to come and work in East London rather than Johannesburg? But that's, that's exactly the point we're driving here mm. in terms of ensuring that we change the economic development landscape of the province so that it is able to attract uh, those skills back into the province. Uh, that is why you, we, we talk of uh, the ports, your Kuka transshipment. We are now attracting those skills that uh, had been to other provinces back to Kuka, back to our province. Um, and, and therefore, the drive, the water, Mzimfubu uh, Dam, we're going to need a lot of uh, highly skilled personnel. We, we're driving those projects precisely to ensure that um, we, we attract people back to the province. And therefore, the face of the province is changed e economically. Uh, and, I'm, I'm, and I'm still saying, for as long as the, the big companies, head offices are elsewhere in the country, you will find people going to those places for, um, as greener pastures, but also we should be appreciated as a province for the role that we do in shaping leadership and skills okay. for the country. All right. Okay. Well, let's go to our tables again. Table number four, uh, Mzuyanda. Table number four, Mzuyanda. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, I'm, I'm standing to, to add my voice in saying that, indeed, the SNK province is a better place than it was before 1994. Uh, I also observe, uh, Honorable Premier, with appreciation, the high pace of building national and provincial roads. However, rural roads need some, some attention. Now, as someone who's coming from the rural areas, some the, attention. The, the question is, what then becomes the plan to turn the situation around in terms of rural roads? Thank you. Okay, so infrastructure development. Who wants to answer that? Um, uh, thank you very yeah. much, uh, 
I think I can confirm that uh, indeed as part of complementing the work that the province is doing when it comes to provincial roads plan, there is now a provincial roads master plan that this uh, cabinet has endorsed and I think it's a blueprint that will complement local government infrastructure plans that are there. When we are delivering access roads, as we are now having 2.9 billion under the current financial year to ensure that uh, those access roads that are causing people to reach clinics and schools, as well as provincial proclaimed routes that are also connecting with the national N2 roads and so on, are going to ensure that there is efficiency, there is movement of goods and services in this province. And I think that is a plan now adopted. Going forward, we are focusing on that program. And I think uh, many people will bear testimony that uh, going to other rural areas that were unreachable before, you can access those areas. With those smaller bridges causing people to go to school, uh, the scholar transport buses able to move from point A to point B is an indicator that we are trying to integrate our transport plans from local to province as well as national. And I think that is an achievable plan as far as we are concerned as this government. All right, uh, let me see, Tom, let's get back to education. Um, you've, we've talked about the improvement from where we've come from, but there's still clearly a lack of confidence in the province's education system if we track the migration of the students going to places like the Western Cape. Um, have you been able to start to stem that tide where people are saying, if I want my kid educated, they've got a better chance in the Western Cape because the numbers are suggesting that they're moving in their numbers to other provinces. In fact, Peter, young people are not moving to the Western Cape before, because they want education. It's because their parents are there. It's because their parents are working there. This is why the kids from the Eastern Cape go, go to the Eastern Cape. But to your question on how we are, as the Eastern Cape government, trying to retain the students in our province, that we are doing with three-phased intervention. Your, your long-term intervention is starting from preschool, where preschool has a meaning, where kids at a very little age are taught skills that are going to ensure that they continue with their education. And also, if you look at your metric, as I said earlier, the intervention there is to ensure that they pass and they get bachelor passes with the interventions that I have mentioned before. And I think that on its own enables young people to stay, but those that go to Cape Town and elsewhere, it's because their parents what, are there. What do you put as the biggest impediment that's kept you as the poorest performing province? As the Premier said earlier, the measurement should not be against other provinces. The measurement should be where we are coming from. Because the Premier said that in 1994, we are at 30 something, but now we are at 64. And I think that's a great achievement. And we need to be measured by how we progress, not against other provinces. As you know, that our province has a history of having three homelands. I will call South Africa a homeland as well because we had Transkei, Siskei, and also the Republic of South Africa. Mm -hmm. So integrating those three systems took mm -hmm. time because each, pro, each, each homeland mm -hmm. had its own system. But I think we are, the, we are at the place now where we are showing signs of improvement. Mm -hmm. And from now on, the improvement is going higher and higher. Okay, um, MEC Kobashiani, let's talk a little bit about uh, local government again. Um, one big challenge uh, that's coming through other provinces as well, but yours, uh, corruption. You've just uh, had a, a forensic probe that unearthed several discrepancies in the uh, Zinquanta local municipality. And then I wake up this morning to this daily dispatch 
and it says leaked report with mayor since 2013, Buffalo City Metro manager Andile Fani, head of supply chain, Tembelani Sali has been fingered in a damning forensic investigation into controversial procurement of 17 million rand worth of black refuse bags. Where are we if we waking up to headlines like this, having forensic probes, and these discrepancies are coming up that you are concerned about? Yes, thank you very much. I think uh, this is a demonstration of how this government is ready to tackle these uh, challenges head on. Fraud and corruption is not equal to freedom and democracy, and we want to ensure that as we deliver these services and goods, paying with public purse, we are also having a capacity to care. For instance, if I may say, on contact crimes, even though I'm coming there, 4% decrease over the past five years. It's a reality that this province has managed to achieve. The ability to detect crime is now increasing at a rate of 5% in the province of the Eastern Cape. And 80 fraud cases that were reported there are now fraud dismissals that are recorded in departments uh, uh, of this province. And 30 criminal cases have been investigated and people were found guilty. And this is the capacity of the state. It's not a private issue. We are also conducting forensic investigation as government, tabling those reports to municipalities, also indicating to those councils that remedial action is required as soon as possible. The implementation turnaround plan for council to take decisions against those that are found guilty is a matter that we are monitoring. For instance, on Nkwanza, we have tabled that report, we have given them 30 days to respond, and we have reminded why, them why, to... Why is it happening? Why is there this, I won't say culture, but the, this incidence of corruption at this level? Well, the question why is the question that they must have ability to detect as the system because people are running budgets, people are taking decisions, and at times uh, they are exposed to this reality of life that uh, here are tenders in front of me, we can decide about them, but if we don't develop capacity and capabilities within those municipalities of anti-fraud strategies that are now adopted by all municipalities and districts, but the issue is, what are we doing about them? Mm. We are acting upon them. We have now mm. gone to an extent of going to court for declaratory orders for people that are reluctant and intransigent to ensure that we are a government ready to deal with fraud and corruption. So, so is it a concern for you? That On Buffalo that, City, for yeah. instance, we must applaud that municipality for unearthing that kind uh, of uh, ill intent to rob mm. the state. It is Buffalo City that have managed through their own internal um, anti-corruption plans, that have managed to see that there are people in the system that are ready to disorientate the plans of delivery. And as such, they want to self-enrich themselves at the expense of the state. And uh, that is an indication that our municipalities are taking the heat head on. And I think- But the mayor sat on this report for three years, it seems. But the, the way it's reported here is that, uh, uh, that this mayor, the mayor sat with this report for some time. Um, so they've known, but have seemingly not acted straight away since May 2013. Well, as far as I know, uh, all reports of that nature that are supposed to be deliberated by council and council taking decisions and also how to act on those things are not matters that you can just handle them willy-nilly because there are people involved, there are companies involved, all those people must be given space to respond. And I think acting on those things permanently will also give us clean administration that will deliver clean audit at the end of the day. But we are going to monitor also that reported incident. All right. Uh, MEC Maswale, you're the provincial chairperson. And uh, one, one conversation I had with uh, another um, uh, premier uh, recently was the infighting that was taking place within the party. And you, your party is the one that's governing and running things. We had a situation where a mayor was removed by some, some councillors. Um, how is that affecting? A, is, is there problems in fighting? And how is that affecting the running of things like municipalities? Well, Peter, at, at, at some point we, we had a challenge of that nature. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, certainly it would uh, impact negatively in the uh, both the stability and the ability to provide services. Uh, it must be about two years ago that we uh, dealt with that. Uh, we no longer have incidents like those uh, in our councils. Councils are stable. Uh, relatively, uh, people are focused on what must be done. And uh, it is largely to the effort, the leadership guidance that have been given uh, by all the structures uh, of the ruling party across. Uh, yes, I can say relatively that is no longer an, an, an occurrence you can talk about in the province uh, to date. All right, so there's if, if, how many? I said there's how many? General, how many at the moment? <laughs> in councils, yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. All right, table number 14. Is it Ponko Kam Siba? Masiba. Uh, table number 14. Um, good morning, Premier, and your, and your crew. Um, mine is more of an input and an advice than a question. Um, the government from, the, from parliament down to the provinces doesn't seem to be taking the role of the community media seriously. And unfortunately, um, the statistics tells us and the researchers tells us that all these protestations that are mushrooming left, right, and center in our country um, are due to communication or lack thereof. Now, I just want to find out, Madam Premier and your crew and the district mayors that are around here, do you have a plan to maximize the usage of those community media? Thank you. Okay. Who wants to answer? I can safely say yes, there is. Actually, as we have a program as the province of um, visiting all our districts and municipalities. Uh, during exco outreach uh, programs, we spend time in those community radio stations, two hours at the most, uh, interacting with communities directly uh, and interacting with, with uh, communities via uh, telephone calls and the like. And at that time, we normally have with us the, the leadership in that district uh, in terms of the municipalities. Uh, and therefore, for us, we could say that uh, safely. We're not as bad uh, uh, in terms of that, uh, uh, in terms of uh, protests, precisely because we, 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 we have that program, a communication program, we have a plan uh, that uh, guides us uh, as we go out uh, to communities. Uh, we're starting tomorrow, actually, at Mount Fletcher. So we, we, we're there. We communicate with people. Okay. Uh, table number one, Nontedo uh, Zonke. Table number one. Not tomorrow, the next day. Is it Wednesday? Good morning, Premier and the crew. Peter, my question would be, <coughs> Knowing for a fact that the ANC government has not built mad schools, which we understand that the mad schools were undermining the black child, in appreciating uh, the, the progress in making sure that you improve the past imbalances, coming from a rural uh, region in this province, which is Krizan appreciating the modern schools that you have built in rural areas. Uh, I would like just to know from you, Premier, whether how is the attitude of communities? Uh, and also, we are interested to know, in your plan, how do you, how, how do you think maybe you'll be able to finish uh, making sure that we eradicate the mad schools that we have inherited. Thank you. Uh, thank, you thank you very much uh, for that question, because it actually gives us space to explain to the people of this province that actually we, 
since we came into office 1994, the amount of schools built are more than 1,500 since then. Um, because people tend to think that all the schools in the Eastern Cape are mud schools. No, we have, we have built uh, state-of-the-art schools uh, since 1994. And this last term, we have ensured that we don't only build classrooms. A school is complete with its library, with its IT facilities, with its um, science labs, with its um, kitchen for, for children, um, and all those, the school hall, everything. Uh, and therefore, those are state-of-the-art schools, more than 300 of them this very last term. Um, we, we are only left with about, it, this is a wild guess, 300, I could say. 160, as we, we are seated here, is being constructed. We have embarked on a program to hand over these schools to communities. Um, a program called a school a week. Every week there's a school delivered to a community. A fully fleshed, up-to-date, modern facility. <laughs> we are doing that to ensure that we, these schools are not damaged. We, we, we implore communities to take charge um, of these schools as a community property, uh, which they must guard jealously. Uh, all our schools that are built are electrified, and therefore uh, there's no qualms. These are some of the reasons why we are able to improve our results. Yes, we still have the challenge uh, in terms of the numbers. We haven't dealt with all of them. And, and again, owing to budgetary and economic uh, uh, reasons. But uh, I can safely say that by 2016, in fact, at, at the end of 2015, we shouldn't be talking a mud structure in, in this province, but in South Africa as a well. whole. Okay. All right, let's, uh, there's a tweet question that's come through from uh, Silangwe who says, uh, what is the provincial government's future plan for Magwa Tea Estate in Lusikisiki? I want to take that. Yeah. Well, um, the, we should first explain what the position is now. The idea is that, remember that there was a land restitution process. Through that process, the ownership of the, of the estate went to those, the claimants, and to a trust. So the land and assets are owned by a trust, as we speak. There were, there were a number of programs by government and, uh, to create an operational company, which is owned by workers together with the provincial government. And I'm saying that that process has gone up to a point where that company started operating. Um, over the last uh, couple of, of months, we've been working, uh, the Department of Agriculture, um, uh, Rural Development, etc., has been trying to focus on a turnaround plan for Magua. You would actually understand, as we speak, uh, Magua depends on government grant to survive. And, and that is useful because I think it sustains the number of jobs that are there. But I think our plan moving forward is to turn around the Magua and make it more viable, increase its capacity, and ensure that uh, we find markets for the tea that it produces. Mm -hmm. Because markets are a problem for tea as we speak. So All there right. are plans to do that. Okay, I think this might be you as well. Johan Rousseau says, uh, what is the Eastern Cape doing about the state of government and private owned morgues? It's a health threat, not regulated or policed. Is that true? What is that? The uh, uh, state of government and private owned morgues. So where, you know, dead bodies are taken to. <coughs> so maybe there's, yeah. Morg. 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 Mortuaries, yes. <laughs> They're saying that uh, it's a health threat, they're not properly regulated or policed. Uh, from where we're sitting, I think um, um, all mortuaries uh, are regulated. There are regulation. I think you can operate it unless the, you, 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 you follow the rules and regulations mm. uh, required. 
uh, there have been cases, um, a number of cases, where government had to intervene uh, in private uh, mortuaries in particular parts of the province to actually enforce the law in terms of compliance. But generally, I think in terms of the provincial health department and its program, there has been a marked improvement in the quality of state-owned mortuaries in the Eastern Cape as part of the overall investment program um, in, the, in improving health infrastructure generally. Okay. Um, let me see, Mazwale, uh, Luvuyo Nukani says, uh, what are we doing about uh, Ikwantha municipality? There are violent protests in that municipality. Is that true? The, with respect to Nkwanka, uh, the, the MEC next to me has just said uh, that they commissioned an investigation. In fact, it's fact there were malpractices in the administration of the municipality for which uh, corrective uh, remedial steps were suggested for the council to take action on those matters. What is awaited is council to take action on those recommendations. And then okay. th that's it. Okay, so you don't have service delivery protest drama happening in the Eastern Cape at the moment? Actually, I can, I can yeah. safely say that in Kwanka, mm. we were there as the executive council during an outreach, and the communities there raised a number of um, areas that needed intervention. I can safely say that one of them was NOLA, a, a factory that manufactures uh, uh, rusks and the like, which was to close when we were there. We intervened. That factory is operating at a much higher capacity now than it was then. A number of investments, the roads, infrastructure, uh, which they had complained about, we attended to them. I was there myself. Uh, and therefore, the protests that are there are not about service delivered. They are about malpractices that took place in the municipality which were investigated, whose report is now up to council to act upon. Okay. And, and that's what we expect. Okay. Um, MEC Jonas, you've gambled quite a bit in terms of uh, some big projects. Kucha, uh, Wild Coast um, uh, Initiative. And I'm just wondering, have they started to reap benefits? Um, we talked about jobs that were saved, but how many jobs have been created, actual hardcore jobs that you can say, okay, this thing is happening, um, we've put so much money in, 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 into investment, and these are now uh, starting to pay dividends? Just give the, uh, probably the list would be long, and I think the Premier gave uh, a thorough outline mm -hmm. of some of the achievements. Just to summarize, I mean, the strategy for the Eastern Cape is clearly about ensuring that we play a role as a gateway province. Uh, we have ports, so our ports must be improved, and on the back of our ports, try to industrialize and increase our industrial capacity. The two industrial zones are critical for that in that regard. If you look at our industrial zone in the country, Kuka industrial zone as well as Island and development zone, they are probably the best performing zones in the country. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the investment over the last uh, well, if you take East London IDZ, when we took office five years ago, the investment in the East London IDZ was about 600 million. As we speak, we have 4.4 billion investment in that zone, creating about uh, less than 5,000 jobs. The Kucha development zone also has grown phenomenally over the last couple of years. We have probably around 4,400 jobs as we speak, with also six billion more new investment coming. We are building, uh, as, we, as we speak, um, a final construction program of FAW, which is the biggest, one of the biggest Chinese uh, car manufacturing. Uh, entities in, 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 in China, which is going to locate in the Eastern Cape, adding to the number of jobs that we have. Again, um, the, the other projects obviously is the Umzimvubu Dam, that, that is probably far advanced in this program. And again, with Umzimvubu, we're not just talking about dam 
for just circulating water to, to residents. It's also about stimulating agriculture in the area. And therefore, on the back of commercialization, strengthening of smallholder farming, you would actually be create a massive number of jobs in the, in the, in the province. All right. I seem to be on you quite a bit today, I'm, <laughs> but I think that's the nature of your job. Uh, recently at a Wild Coast Development Summit, you said that uh, a change in mentality and leadership was also needed to transform the region. What did you mean by that? Look, I mean, uh, if you look at the, the whole area called, called Wild Coast, or the former Pandustan area that we're talking about, one of the binding constraints is obviously the land question and, and how fast or slow the land restitution process has gone. The second binding constraint is the fact that you do not have massive commercial agriculture activity in the area. Of course, apart from Magua, which is potential, and, um, pond, and North Pond and Sugar, but generally there is no massive uh, commercial agriculture activity, when in fact the potential is there. The third, obviously, binding constraint is ensuring that you sustain and maintain the skills base that is there and use it to drive a massive development uh, trajectory. So what we've done, I think, over the last couple of years has been to put together an integrated program that seeks to capitalize on the inherent advantages of the area. Huge uh, tracts of arable land, uh, availability of water, and of course the potential of the coastal line for tourism, etc. And the program is about bringing all of those together. The leadership change that we're talking about is that I think we have spent a lot of time where traditional leaders will say we own land okay. and communities will say we own land and that compromises projects. That is changing very fast. We actually have new partnership between traditional leaders, provincial government and communities in around concrete development projects. Okay. I mean, we've got one macadamia nuts program, which we're launching and it's exporting macadamia okay. nuts. So that's what we're talking about when we talk. All right, I'm gonna to come to you, MEC Kobashan, about uh, some traditional issues just now, but let's go to table three, uh, Zukiswa Ranto. Table number three. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter, my question is the, the, the Premier and, and her um, executive have just alluded a lot about the economy and skills development in the, in, 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 in the province. My question is, does the program in our economic hubs like Kuha, the IDZ uh, uh, in East London, offer skills to Eastern Cape youth and people living with disability, and women, and how many of those groups, if possible, Premier, you can give me the percentage, how many of them uh, have benefited up to now? Thanks. Okay. Um, I, I may not have the direct uh, figures now, but I can assure you one thing. The, our skills development program is a targeted program which seeks to ensure that we mainstream the development of women into uh, economic activities, uh, activism. Um, and therefore, it targets the special groups, women, um, youth, and disabled. Um, I can safely say that most of those people who have graduated in the drive year skills development by the time we give them the certificate, they are already absorbed somewhere because that is how the program is designed. We work with KUHA uh, to coordinate the program and KUHA in turn liaises with all the other role players, SOEs um, and, and departments to ensure that as vacancies arise, uh, municipalities as well, um, those people are matched. We're using the Department of Labor's uh, portal to match the skills uh, where they are needed and able to, to direct um, young people, especially women and disabled people, uh, to targeted uh, uh, employment opportunities through that uh, portal. Uh, and therefore, we, we, we really have a good uh, uh, program running there. 
Um, let me see, Gopashani. Um, you know, I, I had a chance to spend some time in um, Tata Hospital. And it broke my heart when I went into that special ward where young initiates are being treated for some of the injuries. Um, I mean, it's, it's almost mutilations. I can't even say injuries. What are we doing to address this ongoing problem, uh, especially with these rogue schools that are out there operating and damaging our children? I think let me take this opportunity first to thank very much the traditional leaders of this province, the kings and queenship that are here, that are always a part of the government work to ensure that uh, we are administering a zero death rate when it comes to initiates, because this is not a killing right of passage. The second issue is that uh, there are concrete decisions that now we have taken together with traditional leadership in this province and the House of Traditional Leadership to ensure that where there is high incident rate of death, for instance, in the Eastern Congolese, the measure now is to develop a communal uh, kind of a system where boys will be together with their own traditional surgeons and traditional nurses, combined with the strategy from the Department of Health to ensure that also medical uh, health circumcision is going to be an integral part of what we are trying to do. And uh, young boys, families, households, they must also take cognizance that this is not a government tradition. It's a communal system, culture, and heritage that everybody has a responsibility to ensure that those illegal traditional surgeons that are not known, called Joe, and boys waking up from their homes and visiting them unknowingly that they are in the death trap, some touting boys to these initiation schools elsewhere for purposes of commercialization about it. It's a matter that requires societal input. All structures have been mobilized, organization, political churches, for instance, in the Eastern Pondoland, the Methodist Church of South Africa has also opened the doors to say we can't watch this kind of merciless killing of young boys in mountains. And we have already agreed that we must also look at the question of season. Uh, we are coming from a history of saying uh, which is uh, winter season, because we must avoid floods, heat, um, uh, lightning, uh, striking boys in mountains and so on, and the kind of lack thereof of support because December, as we all know, it's a busy month for them to be taken care of. And that is a decision this province has taken going forward. We are in schools, we are dealing with the youth out of school to ensure that we are preparing for the next season adequately as a province of the Eastern Cape, working with the house, with the police, also with the Department of uh, Social Development uh, and other relevant stakeholders and NGOs on this matter. Okay. Uh, Premier, the, the reports that um, you spent a fortune on the State of the Province Address, that uh, was something in the order of what, three million rand or something, which is just shy of what the, the national provincial address was. Uh, can a province that's not got money spend that kind of money on just an address? Um, this, this question, Peter, has been responded to by the legislature. Um, because again, people tend to forget the constitution of this country when it suits them. I, I do not organize the state of the province address. All I do is to prepare what I'm going to say to the people. The legislature takes care of that uh, function of facilitating and ensuring that there are people housed uh, for me to address them. Uh, and therefore, the, the legislature, in its wisdom, was saying this is the end of term, uh, time to account. And it looked at ensuring that all people of the province are represented. The people that were to be housed there were, were almost more than a thousand uh, in ensuring that uh, the address reaches each and every corner of the province. Uh, and therefore, the issues of procurement and the likes truly are not for me to, okay. to respond to. Okay, well, let me see, Maswale, perhaps you can. <laughs> <laughs>
Shed some light for us. <laughs> yeah, head of government business. On, on what? Uh, the, the cost. cost. Couldn't yeah. it have been done cheaper? The, 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 the cost yeah. related to holding yeah, the event. The, yes, yes. Of, of course, uh, Peter, there is nothing that comes without a cost. Even the democracy we have comes at a cost. One of the values uh, of uh, our constitution is uh, people participation. And uh, in the wisdom of the legislature, as the Premier says, they deemed the occasion uh, significant enough that the people of the province need to converge to be part of that occasion. Uh, perhaps the breakdown of how it got to that, it might then be a function of those who are in the administration to deal with that. For how much did you pay for a tent? For how much did you pay for this and that other item? But suddenly, the importance that the people of the province should converge on that day, it's not uh, somewhat seen as uh, wasteful in any event. All right, because costs can get out of hand, and I think this is where we're going to really. Uh, you're saying that the legislature at its wisdom but you're the CEO of the province, and they must answer to you. The constitution of this country does not, does not allow that. Uh, it promotes the independence of each of the three arms of the state, the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive. Mm. And none accounts to the other. Each of them are, are, are independent. That's what the Constitution provides. And this is where I'm saying sometimes we choose not to understand that when it suits us. Because if it were for me not, not having observed a constitutional principle, there would be an outcry. And the Constitution of this country provides that I am accountable to the legislature. I do not at any stage take decisions for the legislature. And the legislature is not accountable to me. Go and check your chapters on the right, provinces. So who does the legislature in answer the to? <laughs> Let me see. Who does the legislature answer to if they overspend? Well, uh, it's again a, a function really to do with the, uh, the way the powers in the country in terms of the constitution have been uh, distributed. Okay. As the Premier says, there is the legislature. Of course, the legislature has got to create an accounting mechanism within the legislature. The Speaker, for instance, as head of that institution, is answerable to a committee that parliament or the legislature has got to put in place that ensures that there is a, a measure of a accountability for those who take decisions within that institution. But parliament does not account to the executive nor to the, right. uh, the, the legislative well, it side. Do, it does seem that, I'm not going to labor the point any further, but it does seem that um, it, Something is getting lost along the way. If we split things into different houses, different arms of government, somebody has to take account of the whole thing at some point somewhere. But I'm not going to leave at the point at that moment. Let's go to table number six, Makaya Twabu. Okay. Uh, thank you, Peter and the listeners. Uh, Honorable Premier, I heard you touch the issue of electricity. I know you know our condition in Alfred Zoo as a region, but also your knowledge to that, uh, I, I'm sure it's not very far away from the performance of our schools in that region. Where you don't have electricity, in a number of its uh, residents. It also implies that schools in that region uh, are operating in a, in a manner where they can't access the current technology. Now, we, 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 we want to find if the program that has been initiated that assists electrification of schools, even when communities are not having uh, electricity, is actually speeded up. What's, what's your program on that? Okay. But, but secondly, the, the issue of 
the backlog in electricity as, 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 a, as, a, as a matter in that region is, is causing serious pressure on us, especially young people. Technology today demands that they must be in areas where there are electricity. Okay. I, I have heard you saying there's, there, there are nearby deadlines. We, we really want an assurance. We are really seriously strained by, that, right. by that in the area. Okay, so I'm going to ask for a quick response because uh, time's not on our side, but urgency. How do we electrify uh, Alfred and Zo, uh, municipality? Um, all the schools, if, if not all, there would be only a few that are not electrified by now using alternative uh, electricity measures such as your solar systems um, and your wind power uh, in, in schools. Because we prioritize schools and clinics um, in that respect. But as we know, um, that we took a decision to work with ESCOM in ensuring that that part of the, the province, which actually did not have the basic of infrastructure for us to roll out uh, electricity. They started with, um, 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 power stations, mini, mini power stations. Mm -hmm so as to be able to roll out electricity because you don't just go and, and, and uh, uh, electrify a house without uh, the supply where electricity must come from. And, and therefore, ESCOM in the last year and this year has been busy with those uh, uh, substations. This is the word I was looking for. And now the substations are almost done. They are rolling out. Um, Mr. Teismola is here, the ESCOM uh, provincial manager. Uh, he has sh shared with the, us in the province the plan to, to ensure that at least come 2016, because there you take serious, serious backlogs. 2016, and uh, we shall be talking less of um, all right, so, so that give, pressure. give us a date now. When no, can everybody in Alfred and Zoe switch <laughs> on electricity, put a plug in their computer no, and do their homework? Actually, actually uh, the mayor understands and knows the program. Uh, he does sit in the... He does sit in the, in the MinMEC where we invite SOEs like ESCOM to table their program for the whole province. But give us a date. People are, are going to be making a decision about which party no. to vote, and they want to know. Electricity is being rolled out there now, as we speak. I'm saying the schools are almost all electrified through alternative means. The ESCOM program is being rolled out as we speak. I'm in indicating that the substations, which were not there in the past, and are now there, and therefore the rollout is faster now than it was uh, in the Previous years first. before. Okay, uh, MEC uh, Tom, I don't know if you can answer this question. Tabo uh, let's say so says, I've just seen a kid falling on a busy road en route to school. Uh, where are the patrollers to help kids cross roads safely? What about his bad future? Uh, he doesn't say, but okay. you know, he's obviously quite concerned that a child is trying to cross the road on his own and he fell. I don't think it's here, Peter. It's not But, but there are patrollers. We, we do have patrollers. Are they everywhere, in other words? Wherever it's dangerous for, people, for children to cross, we do have patrollers. Maybe if that person could be specific and tell us right. where this is. Okay. So that maybe if it has happened, we would go there and try to see what we can do. All right. Tabo, if you could tell us where that uh, took place, uh, we'll get an answer for you hopefully before uh, the end of the program. Uh, Moody uh, Mudzelwana says, uh, most municipalities don't have waste officials, but environmental health officers. How is this going to be addressed? Who can answer that? Uh, 
Most definitely sure. We are also monitoring the appointments of Section 56 managers in various municipalities and the directorate responsible for that, which is always termed uh, community services. Uh, it's where we want to ensure that uh, technical expertise are provided because if uh, waste managers are not there, the refuse removal, also the dumping sites as well as the legislation that is there, that is supposed to be keeping compliant with the norms and standards of environmental management, surely will be found wanting if we are not heeding to that. I think it's a question now of finalizing. We know now how much and how many posts that are still vacant in that particular area in various municipalities and municipalities are contracting and employing uh, relevant officials. And I think uh, if there is a specific area where that individual is reporting from, it's a matter that we can follow up as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, table number two, I think it is. Uh, Nancy Sidwazi. Uh, sorry? Sidwazi. Ah, okay. There we go. Table number two. Sidwazi. Is that correct? Am I reading this properly? Well said. Yeah. Well said, Peter. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay. so why? Um, Madam Premier, thank you. Good morning, Peter. Yes. And your executive. The, the Eastern Cape, you have showed a huge dedication and commitment to improve the quality of life of our people. As a mother of 6,2 million people, what makes you not to sleep well? What is that you believe it has not happened well? Thank you, madam. Okay. <laughs> parents, parents abdicating their responsibility to be parents. That haunts me. Most areas where we are, we are challenged as a province is where parents do not play their responsibility well. You talk Ulualuko, you talk street kids, you talk um, teenage pregnancy, you talk um, a, a lot of this uh, gender-based violence, a lot of these are attributed, I can attribute to parents not doing their job uh, effectively as parents. Mm -hmm. the, the number of people on social grants here can only reduce when parents ensure that they play their role effectively. Because government is providing opportunities. Government is providing opportunities. Whether you talk education, just now, Mamuslai, in the state of the province address, I had said I would add on the 20 million rand that we normally issue out as bursaries for learners in the province. I said in the state of the province address, I took the decision to add 10 million. That was last week. But when, when I was still confronted by the, the inadequacy of that amount, I further forced the DG to go back to the budget of the OTP to say, scrap to the last cent, we are on the last month of the financial year now and he has been able to find another 10 million. That is intended to ensure that our children access education. But there's one thing we cannot do. If a parent sends a child to a tertiary institution who is not well-groomed enough to be independent and behave in a manner at tertiary institution who's of money dropouts' needs. Okay. Whereas government has provided the facilities. The opportunities. And I'm saying parents par must do the parenting work 
effectively. Okay, and I think that that's a great place to uh, end this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to say thank you to the Premier of the Eastern Cape, Ms. Notrolo Kivit, uh, MEC um, Tebisi Jonas, MEC Toliswa Tom, uh, MEC Mlibo Koboshiani, and uh, MEC Pumulo Maswale. Thank you very much indeed for joining us and uh, sharing your thoughts with us. And we wish you the best of luck uh, with your endeavors and the future of the province.